in the beginning was the nerd. That's me at 11 years old. The permed mullet was my mother's idea, not mine. It exasperated her that I looked more like my dad and I didn't inherit her beauty. So early on, her parenting motto became, okay, books, not looks. <laughs> <laughs> that was the year she gave me my first journal and told me to go somewhere else, anywhere else, to write my complaints down so she wouldn't have to hear them. Over the years, my journals became my best friends. I could tell them anything. These days, I'm still an avid diarist with better hair. Whew. But now that I'm a grown-up, my work with journals is all about encouraging the writing of others at the hospital bedside, many of whom have never seen themselves as writers before. I work with people, pen and paper, because that's technology I can understand. It doesn't matter what, how much, or when a patient I works with wants to write. It doesn't matter if they want to share their writing with me or just enjoy some quiet time alone with their journals. But no matter how someone uses it, I believe that arming a person with pen and paper can help her slow down long enough to separate what's important from what's not. With so many things spinning out of our control, especially when we're sick, journals are a simple way to restore agency, dignity, and privacy to a life. Now, there's no wrong way to keep a journal, but I think it's a shame not to try. My mother encouraged my writing at an early age, partly because she wanted me to shut up and stop whining, please, but also because she had a story inside her and she just couldn't get it out. The poet Maya Angelou once said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. And I could see that this was so. My having played a witness to this agony <coughs> informs a great deal of why I do what I do. My parents met in the very top of Finland just before the Americans landed on the moon. My mom told me that story again and again. And one of my greatest regrets in life is that I never really learned Finnish well partly because there was so much to examine about the details of that crazy story, but also to learn more about this land she called home. But my mom did teach me one great Finnish word that I get to teach to you. She slipped it to me like a secret, a secret you now know. Are you ready for it? Okay. The word is sisu. Can you say it? <gasps> Y'all speak Finnish beautifully. Now, it's one of those funny little words that doesn't have an exact translation to our language, but roughly translated, it means guts, or more like guts persistence in the face of impossible odds. But what does that look like? This is Attack by Edvard Isto, 1899, the height of the Finnish Golden Age. The girl is Finland, the two-headed bird is Russia, and that book they're fighting over is books the Finland's Book of Common Law, her very right to be. Finland persisted and eventually won out against the impossible odds of her bigger Russian neighbor, a fact which informs Sisu to this day. But now I look at that painting and I see myself holding onto my journal in the face of the two-headed eagle of sickness and suffering. Sisu is something like a prayer to me, something that I say to myself every day in my work. Don't you try to take my journal away from me. I feel honored to have the privilege of putting journals and the arts with the help of my esteemed colleagues to the service of people who may never have had time for such things before. Art is such a small word, and yet it carries a lot of baggage in our culture today. Offered the wrong way, it's loaded with entitlement, whereas illness is the equal opportunity destroyer. So we take nothing for granted. We know that the ability to read a poem we may put on the hospital wall is one that many in our community may not share. Folks already feel sick and scared. They don't want to feel dumb, too. But we also know that art offered with a genuine sense of welcome can communicate something beyond the limit of scientific measure. There is no medical code for the human condition. So much of our work together as a team 
is about searching for the simplest way in to offer an approach to arts that's down to earth, friendly, and hopefully fun. Now, the thing about getting someone to write is, first, you have to convince them that they have something to say. And to do that, you need to listen. I listen all day to people who haven't been given much of an audience before, particularly up in our psychiatric ward. One of my biggest hits up there is a little card game I made called Count to Three. I pass out these handmade, handwritten, colorful cards with wee lists of threes on them. Three things I love to wear. Three things I'm really good at. Or even th three things that just really tick me off. For some reason, my fellow staff love that last one. <laughs> Anyone can play. If you're manic, three gives you a limit. If you're depressed, three doesn't seem too overwhelming to start. <laughs> and because all of the prompts are different, the game encourages curiosity instead of competition. Patients love it, and staff appreciate the way it helps them discover something they may not have realized about a patient before. Imagine the insight a psychiatrist at our table can get if, say, the very quiet and composed person who draws the trio, three things I'd take out of my house if I needed to evacuate in an emergency, answers without hesitation, our survival backpacks, our Bible, and our gun. That kind of unguarded and honest response can illuminate a person's suffering and let us help better if we listen. I realize that my approach to writing may seem unstudied, but I hope it doesn't strike you as glib. In my experience, even when facing life-threatening illness, working on a human scale is vital. The handmade and the colorful are life-affirming, and they're a total surprise in a hospital with so much beige. When I open with a sense of humor, it's like checking for a pulse. If you laugh, I know two things. You hear me, and maybe you get me. And we've got to start somewhere, because when I walk into your hospital room, it's a little bit like I'm stepping onto a blank page. I have no idea what your deal is most of the time. Diagnosis, prognosis, it's not my role to know. And yet that innocence between us, the fact that we're just two people in that moment, instead of two strangers at the ever-moving line between the sick and the well, relieves us both of the pressure to control the uncontrollable. I believe that a sense of humor is the ability to tell what's important from what's not. And the minute that goes, look out. In every TED Talk, there's got to be a science-y part, so here's mine. Studies show that writing eases blood pressure, increases improved lung and liver function, eases pain, increases the development of healthy T lymphocyte cells in your brain, and helps you remember what to get at the grocery store. It also gives you sen a sense of accomplishment. When my mother wrote beer, cigarettes, and half and half at the top of every page of her smoky little notebook, it wasn't because she'd ever forget such happy essentials. It was because it gave her a sense of comfort and control. And in hospitals, where little can be said for comfort, so much control is out of your hands, and you surrender yourself absolutely to the goodwill of the staff, receiving a little bit of control back in the form of a journal is a powerful gift. It says, here's something you can do. Now, how many times have you been told you really should write your questions down for that skinny little 15-minute doctor's visit? But has anybody in the medical profession actually given you the stuff to do it? Giving a journal is also empowering to a patient. It says, here's a way you can keep us accountable. So instead of asking why a hospital should bother giving people the tools to write, maybe the question should be why so many hospitals do not. As far as the art part goes, what to write about. It's never about the thing. It's about the connection over the thing, the freedom through the thing. To that end, I learned early on in my work in the cancer ward that I had to be very careful about my choice of words about my thing. If I walked into a room and said, hey, have you ever kept a journal? The patient could grow quiet and wonder why. Oh, is it like time for me to start writing my memoirs now? 
oh my God, I am so dying, and they didn't want to tell me. And the thing is, I don't know that. So sometimes I don't even call it a journal. It's funny how the simplest word gets loaded the wrong way, depending on the room. I'll say, hey, you know that feeling when you remember exactly what you wanted to ask the doctor or nurse the second they're out of the room? Totally. Here's a place for you to write that down. How are you today? And that last word, today, is important. It's all we have, and it keeps us mortal and in the moment. Our patients and their loved ones face serious problems, but still, even in a hospital where that today is everybody's worst day every day, I've learned that it's okay to find a playful approach to put words to the unspeakable. So sometimes in my Cancer Center writing group, I'll even get people to use a word from a foreign language in a sentence. There is no risk of failure because nobody knows what this word is and they've never seen it before. And one of my favorite words for this game is Kummerspeck. That's German for weight gain due to emotional eating. <laughs> Literally translated, grief bacon. Mm. <laughs> the person who drew this card wrote, after the divorce, she became somewhat Kummerspeck. <laughs> now, even though the Germans have been said to have a word for everything, the truth is that we all struggle to find the right words at times. I remember when my mom got a diagnosis that went from bad to worse. Lumps appeared all over her body, her leg, her back, the top of her head. The doctor called me at home to make sure that I understood what was happening. I'm so sorry, she said but the cancer has exploded. Then her pager went off, she made her apologies, she had to take another call. The doctor called again the next day to make sure that I understood, but this time she used different words. I'm so sorry, she said, but the cancer has blossomed. I never saw flowers again the same way. <laughs> But these days, now that I work in a hospital alongside staff working so hard to ease pain and suffering, I feel for that doctor. She was reaching for words that work, that would make everything hurt a little less. And in her sincere effort, you know, she just tried a little too hard. <laughs> and, and flowers weren't ruined for me. I sincerely hope they are not ruined for you. I just see them now as I do all words after that experience, with a healthy respect for their potential. <laughs> words and language became even more important to me when we planned my mom's trip home to Finland. More than anything, she wanted to go and pick wild blueberries in July. Now, my mom raised me to be an obsessive list maker just like her, so my journal was totally full of notes of what to pack the bendy straws we would need for my mom to be propped up in bed to sip coffee, the portable oxygen concentrator we had shipped from Wyoming, the letter to TSA from the doctor explaining why I was carrying so much morphine. Three days after we landed, we were checking into a hospital. My family's shock was obvious. She told them that she was sick, but she'd left out the lung cancer part. I reported to the doctor a case of too much sisal. Few of my mom's nurses spoke any English, so I got out my journal and a 20-year-old phrase book, and I tried to write my questions down in Finnish, a famously impenetrable language. My questions had to sound like crazy talk to the well-meaning staff. Uh, peace, death, not happen, no pain, myth, and lie, morphine expensive. <laughs> then my mom had difficulty talking, and words stopped working for us both. I asked my mom if she'd like to see the hospital chaplain. She drew my hands to her face. I think that meant yes. But when the priest walked in the room, he looked so serious, you know, like with the necky thing. And my mom looked so scared 
I thought maybe I'd read her wrong. But then he did something absolutely brilliant. He reached into his bag and he pulled out two Bibles, one in Finnish, one in English. These were words that could work. Now, we weren't sure that she was sure where she was anymore because after a while, all hospital rooms kind of looked the same. So we turned to the same verses and read them in tandem just to cover all of our bases. Herra, kuule minä ruukakseni ja anna minun huultoni tykkäs tulla. Lord, hear my prayer. I lie awake. I have become as a bird alone on a roof. He couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Finnish, and Mom just couldn't speak. But that man's act of kindness put all three of us together in the human condition. The verses don't matter. Please, friends, understand me on this. He could have pulled out two copies of the Talmud, two copies of the Quran, or two copies of On the Road by Jack Kerouac. It's never about the thing, right? It's about the connection we make of ourselves through the thing. That man's act of kindness paid such honor to a trip that was so important to this woman. Looking back, that trip was full of impossible odds. But my mom made her lists. She decided what was important to her. And she died in Finland with a blueberry stain on her lips. When I took this job, I wondered how I could possibly be a service to the sick if I couldn't make them well. I even wondered, what am I doing here? But that experience taught me that sometimes working with the tools you have and being present is more than enough. So now I do this with what I have today, journals. Having a journal is a powerful way to take back some control in an uncontrollable situation. You may feel completely surrendered to the staff, but your own hand across the page is a tactile reminder of your own right to be. I wish you all health and wellness, but if I see you in our hospital, please know, when I offer you a journal, I'm not asking you to write for me, I'm asking you to write for you. Thank you.